Our volunteer from the Frog Club for the benevolent offering. Can I get a volunteer for that? All right, Mr. Lucas, come on up. All right, this offering is special because we give it to each other. This is a way of us sharing our love for each other by sharing some monetary gifts once in a while to each other. And it's just a way for us to get through the year sometimes. Uh, everybody's had a heater broke, a car broken down, no gas money, whatever the case may be. We just want to be there for one another to support one another. Does that make sense? All right, so I'm going to pray. I'm going to have you pass that out, okay? Father God, we thank you so much that we can be here as a church family and to be here for one another. Lord, we just pray that as we give these gifts, that they'll be used wisely, that they would really touch somebody's life at the right moment. And Lord, we just pray that you bless them um, because they felt our love. Pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, head out there, brother. <clears throat> so for the rest of us, um, I do want to get right into the service. Uh, I was planning an hour service. I'll try to make the uh, teaching, uh, I won't say as short as possible, but I don't plan on being here for too much longer. But with that being said, I do want to start off with talking about where we left off the last couple of years, all right? So over the last couple of years, we've had this vision statement um, that says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children, children are walking in the truth. And that's found in 3 John 4. We've been talking about that for the last two years. And hopefully as a parent or as somebody who loves children, your desire is to spend as much time with that child as you can in order to raise them up in the faith, in order for them to really understand the gospel truth of Jesus Christ, that he came uh, in the form of a babe, that he died for us, that he beat death by raising to uh, new life, and that he has also given us that same promise, to give you new life when you die uh, in all of eternity with him, And we just so hope that every kid who comes through this building hears the gospel message, that they would claim it for themselves and be able to live it out. But likewise, uh, we were all thinking about us as adults, uh, being children yet, who aren't fully matured. I don't think there's any adult here, regardless of your 20 or 90, who would say, I'm totally spiritually mature and I don't need to grow up anymore. But we, ha we have to be able to say that we need to walk in truth, that we need to grow and understand the gospel more, understand scripture more, and really walk out our faith in truth and pushing aside any false assumptions that we have about what faith is or how to live the Christian life that we've been carrying for a while that may not actually be, you know, the way that the Bible describes us as living our life uh, for him. This year, I'm going to give you a new vision statement, and I'm going on a, on a limb here in the sense that in, the, in our church constitution, not that you need to know this, but the pastors should be casting a vision for the church, and this is the vision that I have for the church, all right, for our for First Baptist Church. This is found in Acts chapter 2, verses 42, which says this, they, that is the church that was meeting in Jerusalem, were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, the reason why I chose this vision statement, and I've been thinking about it for a while, is that we've already been continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. We've already kind of got that nailed down. I'm not saying that we're avoiding any more teaching. Uh, we want to really continue what the progress we've already started. We don't want to avoid important sections of Scripture. We definitely have been... Uh, thinking about some very difficult sections of Scripture, even as we've been going through 1 Corinthians. But we want to add to that, add to that teaching, a new layer, uh, an old layer, a layer we've been doing to, a, to, to, to an extent already as a church. But I really want to focus on this idea of fellowship even to a greater level here in 2023. So I hope you'll Write that in your sermon journal, even if it's just a reference, Acts chapter 242, and challenge yourself to think about what it really means to be part of a fellowship. And, and to that point, you've already done it this morning, right? You have a kid sitting next to you, maybe that you haven't had sitting next to you, the entire breadth of you being here in this church, right? Because they're part of the fellowship. They're an important part of the fellowship. And it's important for us to get to know each member of that fellowship and be dedicated to them. And Church, I would encourage you that you be, need to even be more dedicated uh, to the children uh, than maybe any other part of this congregation. But if you have your sermon, German, sermon notebooks this morning, we're going to be talking about two topics very quickly. One is fellowship, and the other one is jealousy. These are going to be our two topics that we're going to talk about very quickly. 
And today's day is January 1st, 2023. So if you get these down now, I mean, you won't have wasted a day for the entire year. You'll be, you know, doing good. All right? So keep that in mind. Our sermon title this morning is just that. I'm going to think about this phrase, provoke to jealousy. And we're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, specifically 14 through 22. So let's do that. Uh, We're commanded to read Scripture publicly. Uh, It's good for us to do that, so let's do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 14, says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, you judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we uh, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Look at the nation of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become a sharer in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of the of demons, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? All right, and let's pray one more time before we get started. Father God, we have a lot to talk about very quickly, and Lord, we want to actually take the most time here this morning talking about the Lord's Supper, and we want to be able to take that here soon, to be able to remember again uh, your death on the cross and the blood that was spilt for our sins. Lord, we know that's a free gift, and we cannot thank you enough for it. Lord, as we talk about serving you, honestly, with an open heart and open mind, we just pray that these words would ring true in our ears, that we would be very faithful to you once we hear these words, and that we would choose to live this coming week in a new light and in a new life with you. We pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this week is a very special week for Margo and I because uh, in a couple of days, it is my 19th wedding anniversary. Yeah, not 19 years, that's, that's a pretty good mark, isn't it? I, I think so. I'm, I'm very blessed to have Margo as my wife. She's been very patient and loving and forgiving with me, for sure. And I can only uh, say that in a couple of times in our marriage that we've experienced a couple of maybe truly rough patches. And if someone were to ask me, you know, uh, what am I doing or what am I not doing? that helps keep my marriage strong, <clears throat> my number one answer is that I do not want to provoke my wife with feelings of jealousy. All right, If I'm going to keep my marriage strong, I do not want to provoke my wife with feelings of jealousy. And let's just, for the sake of defining words, which is always important when we're studying the Bible and even our English language, let's just define what jealous means. First, it can mean hostile toward a rival or one believed to enjoy an advantage. It can also mean intolerant of rivalry or unfaithfulness. And thirdly, vigilant in guarding a possession. Now, when I think about my marriage, I do not want my wife to feel a disposition or I don't want her to be disposed to suspect rivalry or unfaithfulness at any level. I think that's one of the most detrimental uh, things that can happen in a marriage is when you break that level of trust, and I don't want anything to do with that. Now, a couple of the examples that I have in the past, kids, you'll maybe appreciate this one. When we were working at the group home uh, for four years down near Philadelphia, we decided as men uh, working together that we needed man night. So we had Monday man night, right? And so we'd put the kids to bed. We'd all gather in one house. We would buy steak. We would cook it, we would break out the salt and pepper and A1 sauce, if you like that type of thing, and we would eat steak. The other thing that we would do is that we would get the Xboxes hooked up together, and we would play this shooting war game for like two or three hours on an end, right? It was absolutely wonderful. Granted, you know, back in that time of my life, I was, you know, 24, 25 years old, video games were still the thing to do. It was, uh, you know, something that I really enjoyed. In fact, I... Well, I don't know if I really enjoy it so much today because I don't play very many video games now, but 
back then, that was a big thing. And it was a thing that was taking me away from the house. And so my wife and I had one of these discussions one time where she felt rivalry. She felt like my attention was given to something else that was taking time away from her. Okay? So I decided that that needed to go away. And so I, 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 I stopped being part of man night. Okay? And I didn't do it anymore. Then came out this new system called a PSP. Kids, you ever heard what a PSP is? Yeah, it's like a PlayStation Portable, right? It's about this big. And you can actually stay in the house and play with other people online who also have a PSP. And so one of the two of the kids had one of these things, and I thought, this would be great, right? I can get my video game fixed. I can play with the kids, and I'm in the house, so my wife's not going to think that I'm, you know, taking time away from her. But I did, right? I mean, come on. Video games are time-consuming, right, sir? Yeah, they are. Yeah, got to admit that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I, uh, I, I set the PSP aside, and I, I never touched it again. Now, the third more recent one was about the cell phones. Now, it wasn't until I started working at Lowe's and started driving that we actually owned cell phones. Like, my kids were born before I really owned a cell phone and used them. Uh, but the cell phone is very intriguing because you can do a lot of things with them, right? And the cell phone became very um, addictive, right? And so my wife felt some rivalry between me and the cell phone, and so I had to, uh, you know, start finding ways to set that aside and start finding more ways to spend time with my wife. Now, the point here is that Margot has made it very clear how she understands love and how she feels loved. And we could just paraphrase it this way, quality time alone with Margot is how she's going to feel loved. I want to keep my marriage strong. I have got to give my wife quality time. Not because that's something that I enjoy, but of course I do enjoy that. But because she feels loved that way, right? And because she is the affection of my love, I want to give her what she needs. I want her to feel loved. And if I want my marriage to last, I must respect how she feels about love, how she interprets love, or how she interprets my actions that are either loving or on loving. And I bring this up as an example because we see this specific language here in our text this morning. Look at verse 22, which just basically says, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? And so this morning, I need you to understand just two things about who our God is. Number one, he defines himself as a jealous God. I'm not defining that for him. He defines himself as a jealous God, and he defined himself as that at the very birth of the nation of Israel as they left Egypt and walked through the wilderness. If you want to flip there with me, go to Exodus chapter 20. Let me just read those verses to you. Exodus chapter 20. Second book in our Bible, Exodus chapter 20. Beginning in verse 1, if you have a heading like mine in the Bible, it says, this is the Ten Commandments. Verse 1, it says, then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, or any likeness of what is in heaven above, or on earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Jealous, right? Jealous for what? Jealous for the thing that you've created? No. Jealous for your attention. Jealous for your time. If you're spending all of your time worshiping something else, uh, spending too much quality time with something else on earth rather than with him, um, I'd say you're provoking his love. Right, you're provoking him. Uh, secondly, I want you to understand is that we must understand that God, that our God is relational, that he desires deep, int intimate fellowship with you. And because of that desire, he has determined how he feels about his love, that we are to be sold out to him. Otherwise, his righteous jealousy is provoked, and that is not good for us. And so sometimes people have this idea about God that he is just aloof, that he is sitting on a throne. 
He is not interested in our life. Yeah, he may have created the world. Maybe he spun the world. Maybe he's just waiting for it to destroy itself so that he can go back and pick up the pieces. That's, that's not the God that we serve, family. Our God is deeply relational, and he wants to be with you every step of your day. He wants to be with you when you wake up and go through your daily routine. He wants to be there for you when you go through the hardest trials of your life, to support you and share his love with you and give you the strength that you need to get through the trials of the day. Really, the trials and the sufferings that we go through really strengthen our relationship with him. Because on the backside of it, you realize that had it not been for God, I probably would have killed myself uh, because it was just such a hopeless situation, right? And God brings you out of that and, 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 and pulls you uh, into his goodness. And really, if we think about that, as far as God's love being provoked goes, the last thing we would want God to do is to... is to expand his wrath toward us. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking that if you don't love God, he's going to hit you on the head with a hammer. We, we do that all by ourselves. We're great at stubbing our toes and drinking and driving and getting into a car crash. We're, we're great at hurting people and ourselves. We don't, <laughs> we don't need God to hurt us. Okay? When, when God's wrath happens, he is pulling his presence from us. And, and, and when he pulls his presence from us, there goes his goodness, and there goes his mercy, and, and there goes the, the closeness that we feel with him. And maybe even this morning, if, if you're not feeling like the presence of God is alive and well and sitting next to you in the seat with you this morning, is it because you're under part of his wrath? Just in the sense of you know and he knows that there's sin in your life, and because he doesn't want anything to do with sin... He is, he is pulling himself away and you're, and you're feeling his wrath. Ultimately, the world will feel his wrath, as we see in Romans chapter 1, because God will give them over to their lusts, to their flesh, to their terrible ways of thinking. It's that giving over to the lies that are already in your head that really explain maybe at a more deep level, what the wrath of God is. When God steps away from us and we lose his goodness and his mercy and his kindness toward us, that's when we get hopeless. That's when we lose ourselves to our own sin. That's where we find the muck and mire of life. And it isn't until we turn our eyes back on him and say, God, you're right, I need you. I, I can't get through this life without you. And we truly turn our eyes and our attention to him and truly repent of the sin that we have done, that is when he comes back into our life to, to get us through the muck and the mire, to, to give us to a point of love and joy and peace. He, that's the point where he gives us the fruit of the Spirit, where, where we, we're able to be kind to other people, have peace, have joy in this life be able to suffer long in this life, so on and so forth. Family, if you're here this morning and, and you're just feeling terrible about life, just hopeless and lost and afflicted or sick or tired or lonely, maybe like you saw in the, in the Frog Club this morning, you're that person in the audience this morning who puts maybe a smile on their face, but inside you're as gloomy as, as anything. Maybe what you really need to do this morning is just get your heart right with God. And remember how good and kind and loving he really is toward those who, whose heart is truly his. With that being said, I want to just leave it there and get into communion this morning. Because there's no other place, better place, than the Lord's Supper where we can be reminded of what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. You know, he, he has already paid the price of your sin. He wants to take it away. He wants you to not be oppressed, not to live in the slavery to that sin anymore. And family, as we come to the table this morning, I'm asking you to just be, just be honest about your love relationship with him. Is there something that is a rival to, to his attention in your life? Is there something on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night? Is there something that would pull you away from a fellowship time with the church? Is there something that pulls you away from your devotions? Is there, is there something honestly in your life 
that is a, re, that is a rival to God's attention. And, and, if, and if that's the case, I, I would ask you to repent of it this morning and, and make it right. right. And enjoy the presence of God in your life again. Enjoy his blessings. Enjoy his goodness, which come through knowing him. All right. So let me ask for a couple of Frog Club members to help me pass out the cup. I'm looking for Frog Club members that are saved, know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and have declared it publicly through baptism. Do we have a couple of those volunteers? Lydia, I know you've been baptized. Come on up here. Is there another Frog Club member who's been baptized? Come in the faith? Judy, you want to come? I know, I know you've been baptized. All right. Because this, this is a public declaration of faith. All right, and so it's appropriate that we have people who have made that confession. All right, so we practice open communion here at this church, meaning that if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and it is your desire to live for Him, then then we invite you to take of His bread and His blood this morning, which is just grape juice. All right, and what you're really doing is you're just publicly uh, making the acknowledgement that you not only need this in your life, but, but you need Jesus Christ in your life, right? That you need his saving work in your life, right? And again, it's a, it's, a, it's a judgment seat of Christ before the judgment seat of Christ, if you will, where you can just really be honest, maybe for the first time in a long time, about your life and, and get that right with him before we take this. Because again, this is about fellowship. This is about communion. This is about bringing your hearts close to God and making sure that there's nothing separating you from the love of God. Go ahead and pass those out, guys. And as they pass it out, I'll ask you just to bow your heads and um, pray contemplatively about your spiritual condition this morning. Okay. <clears throat> the last thing they want to say as they're passing those cups out is that we are here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 about not provoking the Lord. And um, in this passage of Scripture, as I read it to you this morning, we're talking about the cup of blessing, which we share in the blood of Christ. And in verse 16, we're talking about the bread, which is sharing the body of the Christ. And then in, in the next chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we get the explanation of the Lord's Supper, which says it so much better than I do. So for the sake of, again, reading Scripture, let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. It says, For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. And do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, and here's where the rivalry kind of is explained maybe a little bit better. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he must eat the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Again, is this God's condemnation coming down hard on you? It's probably his goodness and his mercy and his kindness being pulled from you because you're living willfully in sin. Verse 30, for this reason, many among you are weak and sick. Maybe, maybe they're involved in drugs or whatever the case may be. And a number is sleep, they die. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, which is what every child needs from their father, disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world, so we won't go to hell. So then, my brother, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. So we have the cup this morning. If you want to flip it over to the bread, and pull that out. I'll pray for you or with you. Let's, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this bread. We know it's the bread of life. Not, not, not this bread that's in our hands, Lord, but, but you. You're the bread of life. You're the bread that we need. And Lord, we thank you that you were, you were broken uh, and, and on the cross for us, that your body paid the price of our own sin, 
And Lord, we, we know, if we're holding this bread in our hands, that, that we need you. And Lord, we're asking that nothing would separate us from your love this morning. As we think about our own hearts, Lord, find us ready, pure, and, and, and um, willing to follow you to the ends of the earth. Lord, again, we thank you for what you did on the cross. We pray for these things in Christ's name. Amen. Likewise, if you open up the top to the grape juice, reminder, Scripture tells us that this is just an example of Christ's blood that was shed for us. The ultimate cost of sin is death. And the only thing that purified sin was blood. And uh, we see this in the Old Testament where God gave them an example of this through animals that were sacrificed to take away temporarily our sin. But this would be a representation of the blood of Christ, which takes away your sin permanently. And again, family, if you've never accepted the Lord as your personal Savior before, what we're talking about is eternal forgiveness. Whatever sins you've committed in the past, whatever sins you've already committed today, and whatever sins you're commit today or in the future, have already been paid. So it's, it's, it's already been forgiven. It's, it's by faith in what Christ has done for us that God has counted to us as righteousness. And so if you've put your faith in Christ, I would ask you to take this cup and drink it with me. And again, they'll pray and we'll sing our last song. Father God, we thank you so much that we can be in your house this morning. Lord, I know I said a lot of things very quickly. Lord, I hope I said it with conviction. Lord, we, we love you. We don't want anything to come between us. Lord, your fellowship is sweet, and we want our fellowship to be sweet in this church. Lord, from the youngest to the oldest, I pray that you would help us grow together, be more unified together. And um, as we talk about this in the coming weeks, Lord, I just pray that you would bless us for, for, for really walking in love toward one another. Father, we, we thank you again for the great love that you've given to us, and we just pray that we would likewise be an expression of your love by being loving to other people. We pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.